Okay, good morning, everybody. We are in month five of the business startup series with Hedberg Public Library and SCORE Madison. And today's topic is um, business location, as well as some tips about human resources. If you are a startup that will eventually need to hire employees, we have Ken Wondro back with us today from SCORE Madison, and he is going to talk us through these topics today. Go for it. It's all yours, Ken. I'm going to open my tray here, my share tray. And Kara said today we're going to talk about Chapter 10 and Chapter 11 and, and just kind of go through what the homework will look like or what the modules will look like as you go on online with them. I want to emphasize that as we get this deep into the series, we're probably beyond the steps that some businesses are currently at or may even reach for a while. So in this one, we're talking about opening up your business. Where is it going to open up? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be a brick and mortar where you actually have to have a building? Um, are you going to do it through a third party vendor? So it's not really um, you that's doing it. It's just working through your web page. Um, and then we'll also talk about HR issues. And with HR issues, um, though it, becomes much more pertinent when you have an employee. What I'm gonna tell any business that's starting up is that within your plan ought to be growth. You ought to be hopeful that your business is gonna do so well that at some point in time, it's not gonna be just about you, but it's gonna be about employees that you bring on because your business has grown to the point where you need these employees. When you bring on employees, you want to be already ahead of the game. You want to make sure that you still maintain what your business is all about and what you meant to that business. You were the founder. You were the entrepreneur. You're now switching roles and becoming an employer. And as such, you have to deal with the issues of HR. You got to deal with payroll and you got to deal with um, the atmosphere of your business. You got to deal with the transfer of your ideas to your employees. If the employee can't deliver services or products the same way you did, if they can't find the same passion for it, if they can't find a role within your business, businesses flounder at that point. And the entrepreneur gets drawn away from doing what they were best at, that was designing and growing their business. They're dragged into this side of the employer. And um, I just want to point out, or this module will point out some of the cautions that we have to go through when we do that. So that's a that's a pretty good overall of what we're going to look at, and I just want to make I wanted to set the stage so that um, the last thing I want you to do is to say, well, I haven't got any employees, and I'm not going to go find a, a brick and mortar store, so it's time for me to check out. And, um, rather, we want you to look at this as saying, this is one of those steps. It's down the line, but when it comes up, I want to be prepared for it. I want to have within my business plan the means and methods. Um, to um, adapt to that that change. So brick and mortar or home base is the first decision that a business needs to make. Um, if it's brick and mortar, we're talking about you actually have a building that you're going to have to do your business out of. Now, it could be a service business. I was um, a tax um, business when I um, created it. At the time, uh, most tax businesses will go to a brick and mortar. They'll go to a separate building. They'll have an office space, and that's where they meet with their clients. Uh, but in my case, I, I needed to stay small because at first when I was starting my business, I had a full-time job, and I was dedicated to that. I wanted to maintain a side business. I wanted to maintain the levels. So I was able to do it out of my um, home office. But the first problem I ran into was the home that I was currently living at was too small. Um, the only place I had an office was on the kitchen table, and that was not very professional. So the first thing I did was um, sell my house and move to a little bit larger house. And when I looked for that larger house, knowing that I was going to keep this business going and try to make it grow, I looked for a, a house that, that had a separate office and a dedicated space. Um, when you do that, um, you know that's the same as a brick and mortar. You got to treat it as as such as if it's a separate building, creating a separate business. On the other side, you may be selling a product, or your service may be bigger. Um, for instance, a painting business, or a bakery, or um, um, 
an electrician or a plumber, and there they need an actual business setting where they can both meet with the client and have the um, a, a place to store all their equipment and, and uh, merchandise. So it, the first decision is, do I need that brick and mortar or can I just be home-based or in fact, can I actually do it online? So is a physical location necessary? Will your customers need to come to you? Um, in other service industries, um, sometimes um, I work with a plumber. He has no office or brick and mortar space because he doesn't meet with his clients. Instead, he does everything online with them over the phone. And then he goes out to their place of business or their home or residence and um, provides his service. So it, these are the decisions that you have to make looking at your business. The one thing that I would tell you to do is that you have to project. When I started my business, as I said, it was small. I knew I could do it out of a home office. I wanted to, that home office to feel professional and separated from my residence. So I did everything I could to make it feel that way. But I knew that eventually, if things worked the way they did, I was going to leave my full-time employee and I was going to grow this business into a much bigger business. At that point in time, I knew I needed a brick and mortar. So now it became two roads coming together at an intersection where I was going to make that decision. If I was going to grow this business to the point where I needed to have a separate a separate office space, was I prepared to do that? Did I, did I see myself finding a, um, an actual building, hiring on employees, and becoming this much larger business? Or was I going to work my business to the point where it was so solid that I could turn around and sell that book of business to a larger firm and let them provide and all that overhead and take on that risk? Um, I went that later route. But as I moved forward, I had to be making that decision out ahead of it. It wasn't something I could make overnight. Um, can the business operate out of your home? That's what I've just got done talking about. A lot of times those businesses, especially in the startup mode, can operate out of your home. The issue with working out of your home, <clears throat> the customer is coming to you, you got to check. I needed to check with the neighborhood um, to see if there was any covenants against me having a business in my home. The issue with neighborhoods is they may have a covenant that says you can only have so many cars parked out in front of your house at any given time if you're running a business. So they want to control that look and feel of the neighborhood. They don't want it all of a sudden to look like you've got a commercial, commercial business going on, but rather just a small um, office and home style business. There could be zoning permits. Your community could could require certain permits if you're having people come into your home. Now, if your home business involves producing food or manufacturing something, you're definitely going to need some zoning permits because the, the community is going to want to know that what you're doing is still safe. Are you operating with anything that may be a hazardous material, as an example? Professional appearance is necessary. It's critical, is what I'm going to tell you. When I started my business, I had about 25 clients who had known me for a long time. A lot of them were, um, I was personal with them. Um, they were okay with coming and sitting at, at my kitchen table. But when I asked them to refer other people to me, when I wanted to grow that business up to about 100 clients, which I felt I could operate out of my home, I needed a better look. And that's what, that, that along with size pushed me out to get the get a different home at that point in time. Um, right now with COVID, the phenomena that you're seeing is there is a ton of remodel going on and that remodeling is because people are remodeling their offices. They realize that if I'm gonna start doing business out of my home or I'm gonna start doing even virtual out of my home, my office has to look professional. So a lot of remodelers out there are, are very busy. In fact, you gotta wait to get them to come on in and do it. The second thing is that homes are moving. And one of the reasons homes are moving is people are finding out that they're not going, they're not gonna need a brick and mortar space. They don't need an office space. Um, and as such, they're selling their smaller homes and saying, I'm gonna do this out of my home. I'm gonna buy a bigger home. So you've got a lot of, a lot of transfer of, of um, residential homes going on as well. But that professional appearance is important. Um, you're looking at me virtually right now and behind you, you can see my desk office space. 
normally I would be facing that direction, but because I want the appearance of this office on my virtual to be the same as a, a client sitting in my office would see, I've flipped this around and created a secondary desk where I can do my virtual zooming out of, I can turn around and do my um, actual office work on the, on the desk behind me. But again, I want to clean up the appearance. If you are working from your home virtually meeting with your clients, it is critical that what they see is what you want them to see. Don't have them looking at bare walls. Don't have them looking at, at pictures that are askew. Don't have them see clutter sitting in your in your office. Um, some of the worst ones I've seen is I'm, I'm watching them talk to me on virtual. I can't see their face because there's a bright there's a bright window behind them and what I can see is down the hallway into the back side of their basement and I can see an exercise bike. That's all pretty distracting and it doesn't look professional. So consider what what they're seeing when they come into there both physically in your office and both virtually in your office. Um, separation between business and residence is important. Um, if you can have a side entrance um, to your uh, business that they do not have to come through the main part of your home, all the better. Office organization, the physical arrangement um, should be arranged for efficiency and access. When I was doing tax work out of my home, I had to buy a, a special desk that had a swing arm on it so that my clients could be sitting at one arm, my computer and everything could be sitting on the other arm of that desk so that I had direct face-to-face -face, um, um, access to my client. We could sit and talk, we could share the papers back and forth. When I went to actually do the entrance or the key put, they could watch it from where they were sitting, but I wasn't blocking my you know my space with a big screen so organize your office to be efficient uh, physical arrangement equipment also needs to include virtual capabilities so nowadays um, you want to have you want to have good bandwidth on your on your internet you want to have good speed um, you want to have um, a large enough uh, computer to provide a, a nice um, image of what you want them to see uh, and you got to have good software on there. So um, those are all important. Location is everything. So we'll talk about that next. So let's say you are going to brick and mortar, or even if you are office out of home, where are you located? Um, the question that you should ask is, what is your ideal location? Should you be in an urban setting or a suburban setting? I'm working currently with a client who is an acupuncturist and um, body massage, and her office is located very close to downtown, just off the square. Um, for her, at first that worked for the clientele and for the space that she could get for the price that she could afford. But now as she's grown and her business is different and COVID has changed the approach to things and people are, are not um, as likely to be in those offices downtown that were around her, she's thinking she needs to get out a little bit more suburban. So she's trying to move out. She's in the process of finding not only the ideal location, but then a space that fits what her business needs within that. Uh, questions to ask, are you retail, are you service, or are you manufacturing? Because those are huge differences. Manufacturing, I'm not necessarily having my client come into there, but rather I need a space where I can produce, I can um, get around the zoning issues that um, are connected to that. With service, again, um, if the client's coming in, be centrally located. If the client is not coming in, well, then it doesn't matter much where you've got your service located, where your employees and you are meeting, but that um, that you're you're getting access out to your clients. And then finally, retail. Retail is critical. Um, I can't put retail out um, where there is no other retail setting. Retail thrives best when it's located by other retail. It may even be located fairly close to your competitors, doesn't have to be. Some cases you wanna be a little bit further distance from your competitors, other times you wanna be right by them because the client who comes to you is shopping and they wanna look at, at several places at once. If they're within close proximity, you're part of that look. If you're off separated by yourself, they may never come out to see you. Best example, car dealerships. Um, it always amazes me when I go out to look for a car I've got five or six car dealerships within a mile radius of that area. That's deliberate because they know that when people are shopping for a car, they're going to go to multiple lots 
then finally settle in on one. If they're not located near them, then they've got to ask their clients to come out and find them singly. Driving factors for your location, um, cost per square foot. This is expensive. Um, a big part of your overhead is going to go into maintaining that brick and mortar space. You got to be careful with how much money you commit to it. Currently, great news. Um, two, fat, uh, two things are going on that are coming together here. Number one, um, some offices are being abandoned because employers are figuring out they don't need to have the brick and mortar site. They've sent their, their um, employees off to work from home and they are actually letting their leases go. Well, those properties sitting vacant are dropping their prices because they need somebody back into there. So competition is, um, is in your favor now. The second thing is that um, take the city of Madison, and this is much like other cities that are growing, as they build rental space, and they're building more rental space because they're trying to drop the rental costs, um, to the public. As they build those rental spaces, they are demanding that in the lower level of that building, it has to be open for office and retail space. Um, in Madison alone, within a mile and a half of me, there are six projects going up. All of them are vacant on the lower floors. So again, um, that's driving prices down. So right now you're at a very good point. If you were looking to switch over and do a brick and mortar, or you were looking to have an office space for your service uh, business, um, the costs are coming down. Overhead costs have to be considered. Are you paying the utility or is the landlord paying the utility? Are you owning the building? If you own the building, you're gonna have all those costs. So the overhead costs are gonna be the property taxes. They're gonna be the lease costs if you're not owning it. They're gonna be the utility costs that are gonna go into there. Gonna be the maintenance of the building. Um, the ideal um, rental is that I'm paying rent only and the landlord is taking care of the maintenance. They're taking care of all the utilities. They're providing me the internet service and the Wi-Fi service. Um, that's an ideal one, but you're going to expect to pay higher rent because they're picking those up. By the same token, someone, the landlord wants the other way. They want to come in and do what's called a triple lease and just say, here, you pick up all the costs. So you can do what you want with the building, within the parameters of what we lay down in the contract, but all of those costs are yours. Uh, maintenance, um, overhead, the, uh, the whole works. And then finally, traffic needs. Um, again, the client that I was talking to was located near downtown. Her problem was parking. Um, you know, they had to go to a parking lot to pay for it. So then she wanted to cop that. That's a cost to her. Um, on, on street parking may not have been available or maybe there's only a couple spaces. So tra um, traffic needs is how easy it is, is to get to your site. And then number two, how much is it gonna cost to park there? Is there parking space available? Do you have to provide a parking lot? If you're um, renting from a building, are they providing that for you? If you're not renting, if you're owning a building, um, do you have space for a parking lot? Um, these are big issues. The um, tax firm that I eventually sold my business to and, and went to work with as a manager, we were constantly struggling um, with parking. We eventually finally gave up a portion of where we would want it to expand the building and put a parking lot in there to handle the traffic needs. The other problem is how hard is it to get to your business? A lot of times your business fronts out onto a nice main street, but you've got to exp explain to your clients how they've got to come around the backside to get into your parking lot. So think about these things when you're looking at it. Negotiations, what will you pay? Well, buy or lease is the big one right off the bat. Um, nature of the business is the main factor. If I had a business that was growing and I know I'm going to continue to grow it, and this is the location that I want to be in, um, and I want to be in control, well, then um, I'm probably going to look at buying property or building, uh, buying a lot and building on that to build up my business. Um, if I'm not positive, um, when I start out, lease is the far better way to go because I don't have that, I don't have that building to deal with. There are other issues with owning a building, and that's that the business, does the business own the building 
or is the building put into a separate LLC? And from a tax standpoint, I will tell you that the business should uh, not own the building. The building should go into a separate LLC and the business actually rents from the entity that, that owns the building. In this case, the owner bo own, both owns the business and the building. The owner rents from him or herself. Um, that's the best tax structuring to do. Know the area before negotiating. What are the comps in the local area? What, it, what are other people paying for rent in this space? Um, occupancy history. Um, COVID-19 has said that some of these buildings have been empty now for quite a while. That means that the landlord is definitely needing to get someone in there. They're paying all the costs on the building while there is no lease going on. Um, so you may have you may be in the driver's seat in negotiations. And then build out arrangements. Um, I worked with a salon <clears throat> and she had a great office space and a great location, but it needed to be built out. She needed to build it so that she could um, separate out the chairs in there for the salon and she could have the different um, stations for whatever the salon was offering. Um, when she negotiated the lease, they had not negotiated what those build out arrangements would be. And when she brought it up to the landlord, the landlord said, no, they weren't gonna let anything be built out. Well, eventually they came to an agreement, but it cost her quite a bit of money. She had to pay for all the build outs and the landlord was going to own them at the end of the lease. So when she left, the owner, the owner of the building was gonna basically benefit from all the build outs that she had done. So you need to understand that when you go out to set up that lease. And then don't go it alone. Um, use a real estate agent or a real estate lawyer, use a bank um, so that you know that you're not getting into something that you can't afford, or if there's some negotiation power in there, a real estate agent, real estate lawyer is gonna help you with that negotiations. Um, odds and ends, you can negotiate utilities. You can negotiate who pays it or how much they pay. Um, it's possible that the Wi-Fi or the internet structure will be something that's just general to the building. So the owner of the building um, who you're leasing from takes care of that cost. Um, meanwhile, they may separate meter your office. So now you have to pay the utilities. Again, they may not have separate metering. So in this case, you're gonna pay a share of the utilities owner's going to pay the utilities and you're going to pay a little bit higher rent um, or or you won't know they won't um, they're covering the utilities and you have no idea what you're paying to get them property taxes that's an issue if you own the building um, and then finally maintenance again maintenance is yours if you own the building under a lease it may or may not be your cost equipment um, take an inventory of what you need. Don't go buy equipment that you don't need. From a tax standpoint, I used to have clients come in at the end of the year and go and said, well, you know, how am I sitting for taxes? And I would tell them, you know, you're going to owe this much. And they said, well, what if I bought some more equipment? Will that reduce my taxes? The answer is yes, it'll reduce your taxes, but it'll also cost you to buy that equipment. And if that equipment is not something you need um, or something used could have done just as well or what you had could have been stretched out to work. Why spend money that could have grown the business just to save a few dollars on taxes? So you have to be smart about the um, about the equipment that you really need and maintain an inventory. Within that inventory, you'll know how long you kept a piece of equipment, how much tax write-off is left in that equipment, how much life is left in that equipment. And you'll also know that, well, that that copier or that computer system or that station isn't handling the needs now, so I'm gonna need, a, I'm gonna need to upgrade. And then finally compare purchase versus lease um, and consider new versus used. With equipment, I can lease equipment. And uh, leasing equipment says that if I suddenly don't need that piece of equipment or I can't afford it or I find something I wanna buy instead, I can get myself back out of that lease. Um, but again, when you lease, it's the terms of the lease that are critical. When you purchase, are you gonna purchase new or are you gonna purchase used? If used works, you're gonna save yourself some money. That's that's it for the location issues. And I don't know if I have questions out there, but I'd certainly welcome answering any of those questions if they exist. Um, anything out there, Kara? I don't see anything in the chat, but I, um, I, I have a question myself maybe. Um, something that came to mind when you were talking when you first mentioned about 
um, you know, checking your local local ordinances or neighborhood covenant agreements or neighborhood association bylaws, whatever the case may be for your situation. What about ADA? I know I, I feel like ADA even comes into play sometimes if you have a home based business and you need to ensure that all kinds of customers can get to you. Do you know anything about that or have any comments or any experience with that? Um, not detailed. If, it, if you're in a commercial setting, if you've, if you've got a separate building, um, yes, you are going to have to be very careful about the ADA rules. You're going to have to look and, and find out what your access is. Now, you may, uh, for instance, you could have a home where your office is in the lower level uh, but the clients can come in through the front door. That's there's no assist needed there. Um, that may suffice. But then you have to be able to do business um, where the client comes in, as opposed to making them come down to that office. I believe that in a residence, a home office inside a residence, is not going to have as much restriction or um, um, requirements to follow the ADA rules as a commercial business where you have a, bi a business that's open to the public, you are going to have to adhere to the ADA rules. So you may have to have ramps, you may have to have an elevator. Um, these are all things that have to be considered. When you're leasing, those ADA rules generally fall down onto the owner of the building. They're mm -hmm. the ones that have had to have met them. Um, yours would just be within the space that you're in can they access all the spaces that are now internal that you kind of set up? But that's a that is a great question. That's part of that zoning to um, to consider what that might be in there. The other thing is just common sense says that if I'm opening up to the public and I, I'm not limiting who I'm working with, um, it's going to have to be a consideration. As a private business um, operating out of your home you have more selection ability. So in other words, you can just say, I'm sorry, I really want to help you with your, I want to help you with your taxes would have been my case, but you're handicapped. Either I'm going to go over to, generally what we do is we go over to meet with the client um, on their grounds, as opposed to having them try to come into here or the alternative is saying, I'm sorry, my house is not equipped. Um, I, I can't offer you my services, but here's someone I can refer you out to. I, you have that freedom as a business owner. Sure. Thank you. Um, one other thing came to mind while you were presenting, and that is, you know, uh, um, something that is available, <clears throat> maybe not very much in Janesville, but certainly in more urban areas like Madison is this concept of co-working space. So if you know if, if you're a startup or you're someone who an entrepreneur who's working on a business idea, business plan and you need a you need a place outside of your home to do work and not be distracted by what's going on at home, there are spaces out there that are called co-working spaces that will give you a, a place to park yourself for the day or sometimes there are um, arrangements you can make to kind of like more or less lease a co-working space for the month or even for a year. Um, so those are out there and if that's of interest to, um, you know, someone working through these these um, business planning phases of starting a business that's available to you. Very good point. Um, in Madison, the old craft um, uh, Oscar Mayer plant, when it went vacant because um, Kraft left it, um, they turned one whole part of the building into a community space for entrepreneurs who had manufacturing needs. Um, so that it was a co it was a co-working space. I could go in there and simply rent an area or even an, a piece of equipment and do my manufacturing in there. Um, even with other businesses all in the same building right around me. And that's a right. very, very, very valid point. Another one, when I was in Europe and it's coming, it's coming now here to, um, to the U.S., yeah. is more so in the southern states. Wisconsin's a, a pretty tough place to do this, but they have outdoor temporary workspaces that they literally set up in a park and a business 
can rent again rent cubicles or rent open spaces and their employee gets to work out in the out in the public outside um, great um, inviting environment uh, but again they they share that space it's co-workers and a lot of times they will put very similar businesses together in those sites um, so they're kind of performing the same kind of duties. Um, the whole workplace, that whole workplace idea was already changing prior to COVID. COVID is causing some really big changes to it. So it's kind of exciting to see where it's going to go and how it's going to be different. Um, and the generation that's coming up into that workforce has a whole different um, look and view than the generation that is maybe providing the employment. So watch for all these things to change, but that co-working space, that's a great valid point. Thank you. Can we run forward or should we run yes. forward to the next yes. one? Yes. All right, so chapter 11, staffing your business again. Um, I've worked with several startups who had employees right away. I worked with a tax office. Um, tax and financial office, and she has um, she has at least one worker with her right at the very beginning because she had to have someone um, handling her paperwork on the backside. Um, she will probably, as she's growing, add two to three more employees to that. So she has to be forward thinking about what that's going to look like and how she's going to deal with that. Um, another business that I worked with was a painting business, and they immediately, it's um, three partners, um, they want to do commercial um, painting um, process or jobs, projects, and they knew right away that they had to have crews, and they've got three or four crews running. So they went from being a business startup with no business at all and already having, I think they um, started out with 12 employees right away. So this is not unheard of that your business may need employees much sooner or quicker than someone else may. So it's always good to be looking at where's your business headed because at some point in time, you're gonna reach what's called capacity. And when you reach capacity, are you prepared to continue to grow your business? If you are, then it says you're gonna need employees. You're gonna need someone else delivering that same service that you're delivering or selling that same product that you're selling. Um, and now, whether you like it or not, you're about to become an employer. As such, what are the what are some of the things to look at? So, when you reach your capacity, you know, are you willing to trust others into your business? Um, capacity would it, it's pretty simple. I I, um, I talked about the painter. The painters knew that they were going to blow right past capacity, so they were going to hire employees. I have two other businesses: an electrician and I have a landscaper. Both of them are at capacity. They're making the money that they wanted to make. Um, their business is up and running and successful. They keep getting more and more referrals, um, but they're having to turn them away now. They're saying, well, I can't, I just can't take any more business. When you reach that point, you have to make a decision. What's gonna happen? Am I just gonna cap off now and say, that's it, I'm done? Um, I'll use my own business as an example. My cap was 140. That's all the more I could do. I knew exactly how much scheduling time I had to have to do 140. That had to fit within my free time from what was already dedicated to doing my business the right way. The, not my business, but my employer's business who had, had employed me. Um, when I got that 140, I started turning people away. And I will tell you that that went on for a period of probably eight years. I was telling people I could not, I couldn't take any more, um, any more clients coming on. It was that pressure eventually that got to me. And I said, I have to decide either I'm going to do this business full time or I'm going to let it go because I, I, I do want to serve these people as such. Um, I had to decide. Am I going to hire employees? Am I going to be the one that becomes the employer? Or am I going to find someone else to pick me up as a business and I'll actually sell this business that I've developed? I chose the latter. 
others will choose to say, all right, it's time to leave my full-time employee. It's time to go beyond what I can do singly and bring somebody in. So there's three options to dealing with capacity. One is you can go out and get an independent contractor. An independent contractor means that you're not hiring them as an employee. You're not making them a business partner. You're just simply saying, look, I can't handle all of these projects. Here's a project. Could you take that on for me? The best example where independent contractors are used constantly is in the trade industry. So I'm uh, doing construction work and um, I, I'm at the point where I need, I need two or three more hands, maybe one to help me with demolition, maybe one to do the electrical work because I don't want to take on the electrical work. That's a whole set of licensing that I don't want to do, but I don't want an employee. I don't want to hire, hire three employees to help me do that. Instead, I'm going to go out and get an independent contractor. So I'm going to go into a remodel job and I have to demo the building before I can start the remodel. I've got an independent contractor who says, hey, give me a call. When you got a demo job going in, I'll come in. We'll take care of it. He does that job. He or she does that job. And then they move on. And they may do it for other people. More than likely, they will do it for other businesses as well. They're not your employee. They're just an independent contractor. And you negotiate a, you know, negotiate a deal with them to do the project. Employee says, I control them. So in, in same example, but this time I say, well, you know, I'm, I'm constantly doing this demo. And sometimes I call that independent contractor and while well, he's busy, he can't get to me. So I'm sitting waiting for two weeks before he can actually help me start this job. I guess I need an employee. So at that point in time, he hires someone who that's all that employee is going to do. They're going to move from one site to the next doing the demo for that employer. And then finally, a partner. Partner is, again, I don't really want to become an employer. I don't want employees, but I need somebody else to help me with this business. And maybe, just maybe, I need some an infusion of money into my business to help it grow. In this case, partner might be the way to go. That partner comes in, picks up some of my risk, picks up some of the obligations of the business, the, the actual work that has to be done, and lo and behold, brings along a chunk of money that they're going to invest to become that partner. I don't just simply say, hey, you want to be a partner? It doesn't cost you anything. No, I put $20,000 into this business. My business is now, you know, now worth about $40,000. So you want to be a partner? Um, let's split that. I need a $20,000 investment from you. So the partner can bring both skill and expertise. They can bring manpower to it, but they can also bring financial to it. So we're going to discuss the first two. The reason I'm not going to discuss partner beyond that is that goes back more to the legal part of this whole thing is when you bring a partner and you've got these legal issues of what are they doing? How do they own? How much do they own? What do they, how much of the income do they get? And how will you determine how much of that income that they get? Those are all partner issues that in and of itself can be a whole entire workshop. But I, I want you to at least understand that that's a third option that's out there. So independent contractor versus employee. An independent contractor is responsible for their own taxes. That's big for you. You do not have to withhold taxes from them. You do not have to write them a paycheck. You don't have to do the payroll issues. You do not have to match their social security. That's all on them. They have to report the income that you paid them. All you need to do from the tax side with an independent contractor is issue what's called a 1099. It's a form that the government gives you that you give both to the employee and to the IRS. And it says, I paid this guy $10,000 during the course of the year as an independent contractor. Done. Now it's up to that independent contractor to report that $10,000, pay the taxes that are due on it. For an employee, they work for your company. So you're the one that's responsible for withholding the taxes from their paycheck matching their social security and withholding the other half from their paycheck. Um, they work for you. Let's keep going down the independent contractor side. It says they decide, they decide how to do the work. So they probably more than likely bring their own equipment. They can use your equipment. They don't have to. Um, they generally bring their own tools to the job. Um, they decide within a degree to when they're going to do that work and how they're going to do that work. When I was using my, my demo independent contractor, um, 
I couldn't, you know, I could say, well, I want you there on Monday morning and the independent contractor can say, you know what, I can't be there on Monday morning. I got another job going on, but I'll try to get out there Tuesday. Um, they have that independence in it. Um, if you if you can set their hours and times and demand that, they're feeling more like an employee than an independent contractor. They provide their own equipment. We just got done saying that, their own resources. In other words, they're the ones that that's carrying the licenses that they need to do what they do. They provide skills specific to the task. So um, I have a contractor that I do remodeling. I will do all the, all the construction part of it, but I'm not going to do the plumbing. I'm not going to do the HVAC and I'm not going to do the electrical. So I find independent contractors who do that. But one ind independent contractor is going to come in and do the electrical. I'm going to find a different independent contractor to come in and do the plumbing, specific skills. Um, per hour, um, they're higher. They cost you more because they're responsible for their own taxes and they're providing a lot of their own resources. They're getting their own education, their own licensing. You should expect to pay them more than you would pay an employee, but it's per project, which means the cost could be cheaper. If I hire an employee to be a demo specialist for me, when I don't have work, I'm still paying them or I'm putting them on unemployment, which also still costs me money. If they're an independent contractor, I use them for a job and then they say, hey, you got another job for me? I'm going, nope, not right now, I don't. So I may have paid them a little bit more for that one specific job that they did, but I didn't have any of the, any of the other employee costs that came with it. And when I was done with them, I was done with them. I knew how much I was gonna spend. They're better for short-term projects. The longer, if you got a long-term project, well, then you probably need an employee because an employee is gonna cost you less and you're gonna have more control over the output. Um, employees, they work for your company, right? They don't work for anyone else. Now, the, the industry is full of people who are employees who on Saturday and Sunday will go out and do exactly what they were doing for an employer as an independent contractor. If the employee, do, if the employer doesn't care, that's fine. But while they're with the employer, they're with the employer. They're not during the same day doing odds and ends for everybody else. Um, so the employer has control over the work product and the time. Um, you direct their activities. You provide the equipment and the resources. Now, granted, um, if you're in construction trades, I would expect uh, my employees to have a certain amount of tools, but I don't expect them to have the big heavy equipment that's on me. You're responsible for the skills and training. So um, in the, I was in the tax and financial industry. Anybody who came to work for us, we were the ones who were paying for their education to get their licenses. We were the one that was renewing their licenses. Um, that was on us. Um, when, uh, when it came to training, we didn't just send them out and say, hey, go get some training and you can pay for it yourself. No, we had to either pay for that training on the outside or we provided the training on the inside. Less money per hour, probably but you will have payroll and benefit costs. Um, I'm going to give you an example of that last one. I mean, the the, the time frames are wrong now. I've, it's been a while since I did this. It was four years ago when I retired. But at the time when I retired, we used to tell an independent contractor that they could probably ask for at least $25 to $35 an hour or use that as a calculator for what they were going to charge for a project. They would figure out how many hours. And then we said, you could probably demand $25 to $35 an hour, whereas an em as an employee, they might have gotten $15 to $20 an hour. So a good five, at least five to $10 less per hour. But again, the longer the project, the more involved the project. If they were an independent contractor, then the cost might be, you know, the, the amount of money being paid out might come down. Um, so it was, it's kind of up in the air, but that's an idea of what that difference was. And that difference basically was what the social security was gonna cost that independent contractor. They were paying all of their own social security, whereas an employee, they'd only be paying half of it. Um, and then it's better when you have ongoing tasks, as we said before. So that's, that's the comparison between them. Independent contractors, if you're gonna hire one, you ought to get referrals when looking for the independent contractor. You wanna know that who you're hiring is dependable, that they've got the skill, um, that they don't leave your, they don't, they don't leave the project kind of half done. 
in thinking that you're going to finish it up. They don't leave a mess when they leave. Um, when you have an independent contractor, I was in construction for a long time. Um, when the electricians came in, the construction people were always um, at odds. We had, we had taken all this time to build a really good rock solid wall. We had it blocked out the way we wanted to ready for drywall. In came the electricians and they drilled holes through everything. Um, know how that independent contractor is gonna work with the rest of your, either your employees or with you personally or with the project. And then your responsibilities, you need to negotiate the terms of the contract. It's up to you. Independent contractor says, sure, I'll do that job you're going to negotiate with them as to when and how long it's going to take and what your um, what the finished is what the finished project is going to look like consider when um, consider when you do not have full time work in other words consider an independent contractor when you just can't keep an employee on full time in that case it's better to have an independent contractor and then this brings up another point not one but maybe two or three because that one, if you depend on one person and they cannot come in and do the project when you want it started, you're waiting and that costs you money. So instead, have multiple ones. Have them fill out a W-9. A W-9 is a form that says you're either providing that employer or that, um, that contractor with a social security number or an EIN number and that independent contractor is signing saying, yes, that's my number. Um, what you, the reason you need that is the government says, if you don't have that, they're going to treat them like they were an employee and tell you, you have to start at the very least withholding taxes and submitting them for that contractor's pay. You don't want to be responsible for that. Um, the other reason you need that is that at the end of the project, or at the end of the year, you are going to have to issue a 1099 to them stating for the government how much you paid them. So the government has tabs on these independent contractors out there uh, to get the taxes that are due. Um, determine the payment schedule. Um, with a lot of independent contractors, there'll be 25 to 50% up front, the rest paid either in installments or when the job is completed. At year end, you have to file with the IRS that form 1099 for each contractor that you hire. Um, there is a limit. Um, I don't think it's critical, but it's $600. If you pay them less than $600, you're not required to issue the 1099. Warning, be sure your independent contractor is independent. The more you control, if you control the conditions of when and how you pay them, the contractor's ability to work away. In other words, you say, no, you're you're an independent contractor, but I don't want to be told you can't come to work for me because you're working for someone else. You're going to do all this, all this electrical work just for me. Um, that's not an independent contractor anymore because the independent went away. They're now an employee. And then the contractor's activities. So what are you having them do? If you hired, if you said, well, they're an independent contractor to do uh, electrical work for me, but you got them doing construction work and demo work, they're starting to sound like an employee and not an independent contractor. The state of Wisconsin is the one who will, who will step on your toes. They'll come in and say, um, we deem this person to be an employee. And until you can prove otherwise, we're going to hold you at bay for all the taxes that should have been withheld, all the unemployment that should have been paid, all the workers' comp insurance that should have been paid, and um, um, for all the Social Security that should have been collected on that, um, on that employee. So, be careful. If, you, if you're going the independent contractor route, um, you have to give up a lot of the control. Um, getting ready to hire. <clears throat> if you are going to hire an employee as an employer, you need an EIN. If you formed up as an LLC and got your EIN along with the LLC registration from, you got that EIN from the um, IRS, then you're already set. You, but you need that EIN for submitting the taxes that you would withhold. If you haven't got an EIN because you didn't have employees, um, SS4-online is where you get it. You register with the state as an employer. That's the BR101. Um, on that form, you're telling the state of Wisconsin, this is the business that I do, and these are the number, this is the number of employees that I have. And you're checking off the box that says you are going to do that withholding. Determine if you need workers' comp insurance. If you are the sole proprietor, 
um, no, you're not going to need workers' comp. If you go to an LLC and then later up to a sub S, comp, uh, a sub -S corporation, you now have at least one employee, and that's you. And it's very likely that you will have to pay into workers' comp. Um, workers' comp insurance and unemployment system are capped. You don't pay forever into them. You pay, for instance, with unemployment, you pay on the first $7,000 that you pay an employee. That goes in annually into that um, unemployment. Workers' comp is a dollar amount that you pay for each employee that you have, again, based on, on um, um, your business, your um, uh your industry that you're in. Set up a payroll system. QuickBooks will do payroll. That's probably one of the easiest ones to have do payroll. Other people will actually hire out payroll and go to someone like ADP and have them do it for them. So they don't have to worry about those deposits and about all the forms that have to be filled out. They let someone else do it. But again, that's a cost. Make sure that you can afford that cost. And then establish a record keeping system. For the record keeping system, um, you have to have a personnel file. So who are all the people that work for you and what's the information about them? Um, you need their social security number because you're going to have to withhold and you need that for the withholding. Um, you're going to need their address, their phone number, so that if anybody comes in, they can look at that and, and um, um, find out who it is that works with you. And then payroll. You have to have payroll records. How much did you pay them? When did you pay them? When did you make the deposits for the payroll that you withheld from them for taxes? And then medical files. Um, do you provide insurance? Um, are they providing their own insurance? If you're providing insurance, but they're providing their own and they're not taking the company insurance, that all has to be recorded. Employer obligations, you have payroll issues, so you have withholding. You also have FICA and Medicare match. FICA and Medicare combined are 15.3% of the pay. So if I pay someone $10,000, um, FICA and Medicare are going to come to $1,530. It, it has to be withheld. Half of that, 750 or 700, whatever, $65 is coming from the employee's paycheck. You just withhold it. They don't get paid that, and you send it in for them. But $765 to match it is paid by the employer. So the whole $1,530 gets deposited. Uh, payroll reporting requirements. at the Each quarter, you have to file what's called a 941, proving to the government that you deposited all this money that you withheld. Um, a 940 and W-2s are issued at the end of the year. Um, both to the employer or employee and then to the IRS. Benefits, um, if you're providing any kind of benefits, watch out for non-discrimination rules. Uh, there are ways to make those, those non-discrimination rules easier to meet, um, but the more elaborate your benefits get, the more that non-discrimination is going to come in. Um, the very first one is health insurance. When you provide health insurance, um, everybody has to be included in that in that plan unless they have a they have coverage and they um, are signing off. Um, unemployment taxes and benefits, as I said, have to be paid in. Unemployment taxes run about four hundred and twenty five dollars um, per employee in the first year that you're doing it. Um, but as time moves on, if you don't lay off your employees, the amount that you have to pay into the system, the percentage that you pay in starts to reduce based on a good record. The minute someone um, goes in and, and um, asks for unemployment because you laid them off, um, then your rate goes back up again because the system has to maintain. Hiring an employee, it starts with a job description. Clearly define the duties and skills. Um, don't leave that to chance. Um, both the employee needs to know and you need to you need to receive what you are paying for. If giving a pay scale, use a range. So, you know, when you advertise going like, well, I'm going to pay somewhere between $13 and $18. So when people apply, you're going to have to decide how good are they based on, on what you're asking, how many people have you had to apply. But when you just come out there and say, here's, here's what I'm going to pay, you're going to limit who comes to talk to you. Establish a recruitment system. Um, with a recruitment system, your own employees can recruit other employees that they 
they know personally that know they can do a good job. Um, you can go through other, you can go through agencies to do that recruitment. Um, post your job description, decide where you're going to post it. Indeed is the big one that's currently being used. Monster.com is another one that's being used. Um, some people just go out to the agencies and have them post them up. Continue with the, um, continues with the interview selection. So now you've, you've laid out all the duties, you've spelled it out, what you're looking for. So hopefully you're going to get people who meet that, that uh, definition. Now you got to interview, screen your recruits. Don't interview everybody. Just go through them and say, who, you know, who looks like they're a good candidate here and narrow that down, do background checks. Um, and in some, in some industries, um, employees are hired in only to find out later that they've got a felony on the record and your industry says you can't have anybody working there that had a felony. So you got to be careful to do your background checks, plus just for yourself. Um, you want to know what kind of employee you're getting. Hiring an employee um, continues again. Check your references. Be open-ended in your questions. Um, I've watched people go, they, they're, they're um, applying for um, an investment um, financial planner position. And the question they get asked is, what's a mutual fund? Um, I told that employer going, any one of your interviewees could have gone out, Googled um, mutual fund and given you an elaborate answer. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean they understood it at all. Open-ended questions are, what would you do if? How would you behave if? What would your reaction be if this? You're looking for employees that can take initiative, can think on their feet. Um, and those open-ended questions will tell you if they really understand what it is you're looking for them um, to do. Avoid any impression of discriminatory, discriminatory questions. The obvious ones are, well, how old are you? Or, you know, um, you're not seeing the client, so in your in your written um, questions, you're asking, um, you know, what's your sex, um, what's your religion. You just can't ask those questions. They may come out in the process of the interview, but you're not allowed to ask them because it's going to give the candidate the idea that you're screening based on those things, and uh, that's not going to work. Then what follows? Once you have hired your employee, an employee signs an I nine which again, an I-9 says that I'm a U.S. citizen or I, if I'm an um, immigrant, I've got the right papers uh, to be able to work. A W-4, again, verifies that they're so you've got the right social security number for them. You need to provide adequate and ongoing training from that point. Um, the more you can provide before they get onto the job, the better you're going to be. Uh, but again, it's time and it's money to do this training. Build it in to the fact that you're going to hire an employee and all you think about is I'm going to pay him $15 an hour and he's going to work 40 hours a week. So that's 600 bucks. That's too narrow. Um, how are you going to train them? Are you going to have to pay for that training? Is it just time? Well, time costs you money. Figure those into the cost of that employee. Make sure your employee understands your, your policies. They should be written out. Um, but again, don't be heavy handed with policies. Um, I worked for an employer once that um, every time anything, anything happened that he didn't like, he wrote it as a new policy. The policy handbook had 100 different policies in it. That's too much to remember. Lump your lump what you want together into policies that cover it all. I want a clean work environment. Well, I guess that would include recycling, making sure that my area is cleaned up and neat, that I pick up after myself, that if I've got a lunchroom, I don't, you know, I don't leave stinky food all over the place. But why have 10 different policies to explain what you really want? Uh, mission statement and vision statement are critical. The mission statement says what it is that your business do does. So in other words, what is it that I want my employee to deliver, especially if they're working hand in hand with the client? I'm a painter. I do great painting. I get referrals to the point where I can't do it all myself. So I hire an employee and I just say, well, you're going to paint. That's not good enough. You want that employer or you want that employee to paint the way you did. You want the same quality. You want the same experience for the customer. So the customer um, 
is comfortable working with that employee. They know the employee is going to clean up afterwards. They know what they're going to do all the way through the process. That's your mission statement. How do you deliver what you deliver? And then vision statement. Vision statement is important to your employees because you want them to buy into your company. So what is it your company is so proud of? What is it that your company is trying to achieve? Can your employees fit into that? Can they get that same feeling? In some cases, that means that you have to give your employees a chance for a bigger role in the company. Um, foster loyalty without demanding loyalty. Um, fostering loyalty means you first are loyal to your employees, you model it, um, and then your employees will return it to you. Um, it means involving them more into maybe the bottom line of the business that they feel like they are not just working for the business, but part of the business. That's critical. That's a tough one. The sooner you start that, the better. So the first time you hire an employee, start fostering this feeling of loyalty so that when new employees come in and they talk to the old employees are going, hey, this is a great place to work for because the boss is on your side and you get, you can be part of what's going on here as opposed to the ones who get hired by a boss who demands loyalty. You will be here on time. You will look good. You will do this. Um, too many employers out there used to think that if I gave you a job, you would be loyal to me. Um, with older generations, that was true. If I, When I first started out, if I got a job, I was loyal to that boss. I was like a puppy dog. No matter how bad he beat me, I was a puppy dog because he gave me a job. As time has gone on, that doesn't work that way. So be aware of it when you hire an employee. Wrap up. Do the home, I want you to do the homework for the next session, which means go through chapters 10 and chapters 11 in the startup roadmap. Um, prepare questions from your homework. What, what came up? What did you think about? Look at the different resources that are in there. Try out. Check a few of them out. Um, if you have your mentor already, contact them. If you haven't got one, please sign up for one. Um, if it's not a SCORE mentor, maybe you have a SCORE mentor and another outside mentor, all the better but check with your mentors, ask them what they think about some of these things. So I'll see you in two weeks. In two weeks, we're gonna have Megan Dorn. Um, I worked with Megan Dorn. Um, she decided to go off on her own. She had to find a location, so she can tell you about that. She had to hire an employee, she can tell you about that. Um, she had to figure out how to break away from her employer and still maintain a clientele so that when she was when she was starting her business, she was already in business. Um, she, you will find her to be extremely dynamic and, and um, just a very interesting person. She's got a great story to tell and she's highly motivational. So I, I would hope that you come back and in fact, you know, anybody else out there that's in this boat, invite them to come in through the Hedberg um, Library and register for that. Um, I thank you for your time and patience with me today. If there are any other questions or any comments, I'd be um, love to hang on here for a little while and answer those. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Karen. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Ken. If I can find my way back into my screens, there you are. Questions, comments? I don't see any so far in the chat. I thought of another one again, but it, it it's kind of far back from the first part of chapter 11. You mentioned an, uh, an having to do with independent contractors. Um, what about, so you mentioned like workers' comp insurance and if you hire an employee, you need to start, you need to consider that type of insurance. If you're mostly working with independent contractors, is it necessary for you as the business owner to carry any insurance that covers the work that an independent contractor does, such as errors and emissions insurance or something along those lines? A very good question. You are not required to insure the independent contractor, and you should, in fact, make sure that the independent contractor does carry insurance. That would be one of the prerequisites before I, I wanted to work with them. However, that said, um, you ought to also check with your own insurance provider, both the liability, because they are now doing work on your job site. So though they have insurance and you don't have workers comp on them, your liability insurance. 
um, should be aware that you're having these independent contractors come in because you um, you may want to increase the umbrella coverage on that. The other one is um, casualty insurance. So the independent contractor comes in and in the process of what they're doing creates an electric, they're an electrical con, so independent contract and they create an electrical problem that eventually creates a fire or some damage to that property or the property's new owner now. Um, they, they may have insurance, but it may be limited that person suing for those damages could to ask the court to go beyond. In fact, the court would consider the person who hired the independent contractor to share some of that liability. So again, general casualty, um, uh, personal liability insurance, errors and omission. Um, yeah, if you have somebody coming in that's dealing with personnel records, you got to be some got to be careful there um, because there could be they could make an error that bleeds over into something that you were doing for the customer so yeah good point thank you Not i know that it was it was a oh. heady it's a heady topic <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm glad that you record these. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that even if somebody who was watching live today may not be that deep into the process, someone who picks up these recordings later may say, "Oh wow, you know, I am hiring an employee. I want to know more about it." Um, I think this is a good baseline, a good starting point. Yeah, and the only other thing that was maybe on my mind while you were talking is that you know there are resources, and I will put a plug in resources available through the library or connections we can help you make. If you're in a position of needing to write a job description and you don't know where to start, there are places you can look um, um, that would help you write up a job description. Um, you know there there are job centers and job services out there at the county level that can help you find employees there are job fairs to help find employees those kinds of things a library can direct you to those resources great i got my i have my video off that's okay I exist. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, I don't see any questions coming in. So, Ken, I just want to thank you again for being here for this very an another piece, another very important piece of the roadmap. Um, and we will see you again in a couple of weeks with Megan Dorn present and Mike Matthews present as well for some additional information on the location and hiring topic. Okay, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the, the chance to get to do this and um, share the stage with you. So thank you very much. Yep, thank you.